Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the FCC. Fantastic to have a full house today. My name is Tara Joseph. I'm president of the club this year and a journalist with Reuters. So now on to our main event of the day. What is the future for Hong Kong's young democratic politicians? I'm almost tempted to say that Martin Lee QC needs no introduction, but I will give one anyway. Uh, he's obviously one of Hong Kong's best known politicians. He was the founding chairman of the Democratic Party here in Hong Kong. He is one of the city's top barristers and still active in the law. And he's also a former legislative council member. I think he began his career in politics in 1985. He definitely knows a thing or two about Hong Kong politics. Now, before I introduce him, I must claim some bias in terms of thinking about the next generation in Hong Kong. Martin Lee did promise my husband that he would give pupillage to my daughter when she graduates. She's nine years old, so there is some time to think about it, but I do hope she develops into a future for Hong Kong. Anyway, Martin, we're delighted to have you. As always, a speech and then plenty of time for Q&A. Thank you. Well, it's not really fair that we on the official table were served with our food first. And some of you are still eating. That's quite all right. Please continue. Because Confucius said, don't talk while you eat. Now, I have finished eating, so I do the talking. And you do your eating, but don't talk <laughs> until later. All right? Actually, Confucius, I think, must have a very talkative wife. Because he also said, don't speak while you sleep either. So he doesn't want his wife to speak to him when he was sleeping. Now, why would you ask almost the oldest politician in town to talk about the future of young democratic politicians for Hong Kong? Um, everybody thinks of Joshua Wong when you think of a young democratic leader. I was so impressed by the guy when he said in the, at the beginning stages of the Occupy Central, now we call the Umbrella Movement, I saw the guy on television shouting at the mic. He says, I am fighting for democracy for my generation and the next generation. Here the guy was 17 at the time. So I said, wow, why do I need to worry about the future of Hong Kong? I mean, have you come across such a young leader in your own country. He was already, he made the cover of the Time magazine a couple of years ago. Now, how many of us would be privileged to have such a young leader? I happened to be in close touch with Joshua when he and I were invited by Freedom House to make a speech uh, in Washington, D.C. about half a year ago. And there was another guy who's also very well known to you, Professor Benny Tai, who was one of the three organizers of the Occupy Central Movement. So there were three generations. Me, the grandpa, Benny, the father, age-wise, of course, then Joshua. And we had a lovely time. We were enjoying ourselves. We did not plan ahead as to what to say. But I can tell you, this young guy is good. The only criticism I have of what he has been doing all these short years, I mean, last few, three or four years, is the choice of the party name, the Mosisto. I, I had to check with my secretary before I came for this lunch to make sure that I have not got his name wrong. What a funny name. But ask him when he comes in a couple of weeks' time why he picked that name. All the rest, I am in agreement with him, including what his party wants for Hong Kong in 2047. He says, self-determination. Ah, and Beijing wasn't happy with that because self-determination normally means independence, 
Now that's the right context. But in Hong Kong, of course, constitutionally, there cannot be any independence for Hong Kong. But likewise, for Scotland, likewise, for Quebec, and so on. Now, but when these young people in Hong Kong, our young citizens, who were born into one country, two systems, who were born into a Hong Kong, which was supposed to have a high degree of autonomy, but seeing the interference, daily interference of the central government's liaison office into Hong Kong's internal affairs every day, and seeing that Beijing kept on delaying democracy, although promised to us, how can we blame them for not wanting to accept the one country, two systems that they were born into? And indeed, if every one of our young people is perfectly happy with the status quo, with Beijing's influence, interference, and so on, then Hong Kong will have no future. Are they right, though, when they ask for self-determination? I will put it the other way. How can we say they are wrong? Now, self-determination could mean many things. And it would include many things. After all, we are looking into the future, more than 30 years ahead of us, 2047. What is to become of Hong Kong? Now, I remember my son asked me a question when he was about 10. He said, Dad, why is it 50 years for one country, two systems? It's long enough for you, but not for me. I'll be long dead by 2047. I'm 78 already. Right? Nobody would think of living beyond 110. So he asked me that question, why? 50 years. I will give you the answer slightly later on. So when you think of Joshua Wong and his young colleagues, how can we blame them for saying, if we are talking about 30 years ahead, why don't we decide for ourselves? Why don't we have a say? After all, there must be a number of options. Yeah, people will say, either you guys obviously are thinking of independence. Okay, so independence is a possibility. Then the other extreme one is one country, one system. All right? The 50 years would come to an end by 2047, and China would say to Hong Kong people, all right, Hong Kong will now be just any other Chinese city on the same status. That must be fair, because after all, the sino british Joint Declaration only promises 50 years. Likewise, the basic law. So by 2047, everything will be finished. Hong Kong will have not be operating under a different system. Hong Kong will have exactly the same economic system that the rest of China has. All right? So independence, one country, one system. What about somewhere in the middle? What about a continuation of one country, two systems? I couldn't answer my son then when he asked me that question at the time, 20 odd years ago. And then when I was drafting the basic law in uh, 1987, we were actually in Beijing then, drafting it. Suddenly, we were asked to stop because the paramount leader, Deng Xiaoping, wanted to see us. So we were bussed into another part of the People's Great Hall of China, and he gave us a lecture. He said a number of interesting things, but one thing he said was, if 50 years should prove not to be enough, you can have another 50. I thought to myself, hey, the guy must have had a good sleep last night, obviously in a good mood. So 50 years, not enough, another 50. But what if he had a bad night? He might say, 50 years so long, only 20. Then I began to think again. And it took me a couple of years to figure out why. I looked back. 
I said, in the 1980s, early 1980s, China had just opened up for foreign investment. And Deng Xiaoping must have been looking at Hong Kong, a Chinese city, stable, prosperous, with the rule of law, people have freedoms, level playing field, operating under a capitalist system. My belief is that he was already thinking of leading China down the same road, a capitalist road and not a socialist road. Because if you go to China now, where do you see socialism? It's capitalism, of course, or as he called it, socialism with Chinese characteristics. Right? And now today is the opening day of Shanghai Disneyland with Chinese characteristics. That's why the Monkey King, Monkey King is important. After this is the year of the monkey. Now, so what was he thinking about? He was obviously thinking, okay, let the rest of China follow Hong Kong's example to be successful under a capitalist system. But how can it be brought about? He, of course, wanted to take Hong Kong back. In fact, Taiwan first, then Hong Kong and Macau. But why would he say 50 years no change? Because he wanted Hong Kong to lead the way. Because China was already, China already adopted this four modernization programs, remember? And he needed Hong Kong. He needed Hong Kong to keep what we have under the Brits. Freedoms, prosperity, stability, and so on. So that China will take 50 years to catch up with us. And if China cannot catch up with us in 50 years' time, 2047, instead of dragging us down to their level and have one country, one system, he'd rather have and give another 50 years to Hong Kong so that China can take another 50 years to be at par with us. That was how I thought. And so if that was the case, then one country, two systems is not just a convenient way of dealing with Hong Kong or Macau or Taiwan, but it is also a fundamental system, a fundamental policy for the good of China as a whole. And I was proved to be right in December 2014, when the British government declassified a very important document on the, in December. That showed a minute kept by the British side of a very important meeting in Beijing between Margaret Thatcher and a number of officials, and Deng Xiaoping, and a number of officials. And that minute recorded Deng Xiaoping saying to Mrs. Thatcher, instead of saying, I am telling you why 50 years, he said, our Japanese friends asked us, why 50 years for one country, two system? And he said, because we need the time to catch up with the world's most successful economies. China needs 50 years to modernize. So you don't have to worry about that. It is in our interest to have one country, two systems. Because we reckon that we'll take about that time to catch up with the economic leaders of the world. And as to thereafter, you have even less reason to worry about that. Because by then, we will be at par with the world's largest economies, and we will, de we will be dependent on one another. So once you see that, it's Deng Xiaoping's plan to have one country, two systems for the whole of China. And that's what the basic law is all about. Because to, in the Chinese hierarchy, or under their constitution, a basic law means a law which applies to the whole country. So the basic law of Hong Kong 
means the basic law, which also applies to the rest of China. They must honor it. They must obey it. And therefore, they should not interfere, because that's what the basic law says. But they have departed from that blueprint, and that's the problem. That is the problem that we are facing today. It's not the one country, two systems, the Deng Xiaoping way. It is being departed from. You have daily interference from the liaison office. I mean, let me just remind you, when C.Y. Leung won his election a few years back, the first thing he did was to go into the liaison office to thank them, because they won that election for him. They were twisting arms. Otherwise, Henry Tang would have got it. So that is a distorted one country, two systems. I use the word advisedly. I'll come back to that. So how can we blame our young people not to be happy with them? I have not been happy with them all these years. Because if they want Hong Kong to be masters of our own house, under one country, two systems, Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong with a high degree of autonomy, we must be able to elect our leaders, our chief executive, and all members of the legislature, so that whenever there is any conflict situation between we and the mainland, our leaders must stand on our side and protect our interests. Look at the Li Bo incident. Has our government spoken out at all? I mean, that, that's the problem. We need democratic elections to make sure that our elected leaders will find it necessary, necessary to be on our side whenever something goes wrong. But we have not yet got it, even though it was promised in the basic law. We were told in the basic law, Annex 1, Annex 2, Articles 45 and Article 40, uh, 68, that in 10 years' time, from 1997, Hong Kong, may have it, or can have it, but even now we don't have it. So what China must do, now that China has become the world's second largest economy, is to win the trust of the people of Hong Kong to begin with, and then the trust of the other world leaders. Because how can you be a world power when the rest of the world are against you? How can you dream, how can you expect to implement your one belt, one road policy when the rest of the world are ganging up against you? So I believe that there's only one thing for President Xi Jinping to do, and that is to reverse the trend which has been followed by the CCP, uh, CCP people in the running of Hong Kong. They must go back to Deng Xiaoping's way and trust the Hong Kong people. If you look at the Democrats in the Legislative Council, in every single democratic election or election of the Leg Hong Kong legislature since 1985, since 1991, when we first have elected members, democratically elected members. In every such election, the candidates belonging to the democratic camp have always captured the majority of votes. They have always won more votes than our conservative or the pro-Beijing opponents. And yet, our legislators are always ignored how can you have a structure of government which ignores the more popular politicians who are elected by the majority of the people? How can you not even, how can you deprive them of the right even to nominate a candidate in the forthcoming chief executive election? How can you deny the more popular party, their political rights of participating in government. That's what we have. And if your sons or daughters are not protesting, you better do something about that. I mean, 
So how can we blame our, our young people? But as I said, I am so happy with Joshua Wong and young people like that. They give up a lot of time. They've got to face examinations. But they are doing everything in such a, such a young age. And Joshua is now contesting the law, which says nobody can run for office, either as a village representative or a member of the district council or a member of the legislative council until you reach the age of 21. And yet you have the vote at the age of 18. Something wrong with the law. He's challenging it. But unfortunately, the judge is sitting on this application. Maybe it's not the, judge or the, the judge's fault, maybe it's the system. I would have thought that case ought to be given some precedence because time is running out. So when I look into the future, I am optimistic. I can tell you, it's not easy to find another guy as optimistic about Hong Kong's future as me. Why am I optimistic? Because I think that Xi Jinping is not a fool. He finds it, and, if, and I, I hope he already has found it necessary to bring about change to the way his government, his party, has been running Hong Kong's affairs, has been interfering. That must stop. He must begin immediately to build up mutual trust between the Hong Kong people, including the Democrats and the Beijing government, then everything will be beautiful for Hong Kong. And then the rest of the world, looking at Hong Kong, will say, ah, we don't really have to worry about this guy. Yeah, China is getting more and more powerful, but he is somebody that we can trust. He must build up trust from the people of Hong Kong and from the leaders of the world. And what, how easy it is for him to do that. After all, democracy has been promised to us and has been delayed, delayed and delayed for so many years. All we need to do is to honor those promises and let Hong Kong have genuine democracy in the election of our chief executive and in the election of all members of the legislature. And once there is mutual trust, I think Hong Kong people will say, what's wrong with enacting laws under Article 23. It is a duty cast on us under the basic law. Every country has laws against treason, against subversion and so on, and the theft of state secrets. So long as those laws do not impinge on our freedoms, which are guaranteed under the basic law. And once there is mutual trust, nothing is impossible. One country and two systems can work. It can work. And that's why for all these years, I'm still pushing the Chinese government to honor her promises contained in the Joint Declaration, which is an international treaty and contained in the basic law for Hong Kong. It can work. Deng Xiaoping certainly thought it would work. And Deng Xiaoping wanted it to work not just for Hong Kong, but for the, for the rest of China. And that is why I have this optimism. But if Xi Jinping were to give Xi Wailang another term, we are finished. Then I know we are finished. Then I know he doesn't want to go back to Deng Xiaoping's way. All right? So you, you have the verdict very soon. All right? You'll see very soon if Xi Wailang gets a second term, this is the end. If ABC gets it, anybody but CY getting it, well, I think we have a future. But I won't be happy only if we have democratic electoral laws, or, or rather fair electoral laws, giving Hong Kong people a genuine vote and the right to nominate the chief executive, if the central government's liaison office continues with interference. You just can't have democracy alone. We must have the whole thing as promised. 
and enshrined in the Joint Declaration and the Basic Law. Then the whole thing will work. But if you give us a free choice, a genuine democracy for the election of chief executive, what if we elect Audrey Yu? If the liaison office were to give her instructions every day, Audrey will resign within three days, I can tell you that. So what's the point of having it? Right? So we must have the whole thing. And when we have the whole thing, then there is bright future for Hong Kong and for China. Thank you. As ever, we have microphones on the floor, so if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand, give us your name and organization if you're with one. Who would like to start? Francis. <clears throat> Martin, I'm wondering if you're contradicting yourself. On one hand, you don't want the liaison office, central sorry, government. I can't, I can't hear you properly. The mic is not can, can you hear me now? No, it's too close to the mic. Oh, too close to the mic. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I'm wondering if you're contradicting yourself. On one hand, you say you don't want Beijing and the liaison office interfering in Hong Kong. At the same time, you're calling on the, Be on the government in Beijing not to have CY have a second term. I think Joshua Wong has, himself has pointed out that, you sh that, that the Democrats should not be asking Beijing to intervene because they should have no role and the Hong Kong people should make that decision. The second thing I want to ask you is okay, this. Okay, can you, can you, like, let me give you that because I can't remember two questions. Okay. Now, realistically, we know what will happen at the next election, which is by an election committee, all right? Because we know that the next chief executive will not be elected by the Hong Kong people, one person, one vote, because that package was defeated in LegCo, all right? So realistically, the law is that the next chief executive, unless we change it, of course, and there's still time, if we don't change it, then in 2047, uh, 2017, the next chief executive will be elected, nominated and elected by the election committee, which Beijing controls. Beijing controls more than 900 members out of 1,200 in the election committee. Now, yes, Beijing therefore can decide and will decide who the candidates are, and then Beijing will simply do what they did a few years ago and make the guy they really want to win, win. So realistically, if we don't want CY Lerm to have a second term, who has the say? Who can do it? Not you and me, all right? Because if, if, if you take a public opinion poll, CY Lerm will, of course, <laughs> he may have 5% support. He may, all right? So clearly he's not going to be the guy. But the people have no vote. And if Beijing wants him, who will say to me that he won't win? So realistically, only Beijing can stop him. That's reality. Of course, I agree. Ideally, if Hong Kong people have a choice, we should be left alone. Beijing should not interfere. And even with this election committee at the last time when Henry Tang was competing, they did not even trust their own people, which constituted the huge majority of this election committee uh, four years ago. Beijing, everybody knew, it's, it's open secret, twisted arms, and make sure that Henry Tang will not get it, but Si Wai will get it. I mean, that is the reality. They decide who wins. Of course, ideally, Beijing should leave it to Hong Kong people to nominate democratically our candidates and then to elect democratically our chief executive. But failing that, at least Beijing should allow the election committee, which it controls, to f at least nominate and elect according to their will. But we know that it didn't happen that time. All right? So I agree with Joshua and other people say, why do you ask Beijing to do anything? But I'm telling Beijing not to do something which they should not do. I'm not asking. You see, the two sides of the coin. When you say Beijing, Beijing will decide who will become the next chief executive. I'm afraid that is going to be a fact unless the electoral laws are changed. Okay? But realistically, I'm telling them, 
Don't decide for us. Let us decide. If I'm allowed a second one. Um, you say you're optimistic. If you think of 1991, the first election, and the tremendous enthusiasm and energy that people had, that sense of optimism, you don't feel anything like that today. Um, how, how would you compare the mood in Hong Kong today and, and why it's so different from then? Well, the mood cannot be created by a single person. The mood can only be created when the right thing is being done by people who have authority over Hong Kong. And at the moment, it's a very sad thing that Hong Kong's future lies with one person. And that is what one country, two systems mean under the Joint Declaration. But it shouldn't. It shouldn't, but realistically it is. So I cannot change the mood of Hong Kong people. It's no good if I'm highly optimistic. I'm cautiously optimistic, but even if I'm 100% optimistic, so what? People say, this guy's mad. And I will be mad if I'm, I, I can tell you I'm 100% optimistic that Hong Kong will have a bright future tomorrow. But I'm saying things are going, have reached such a stage that it's really decision time for Beijing or the top leader. But if you look at the last visit to Hong Kong by a Chinese leader a few weeks ago, isn't that, don't you see something strange there? Right? Zhang Takong, number three guy in the Chinese government, the top guy in charge of Hong Kong, standing there listening to the four democratic legislators complaining when Si Wai Long was just next to them, complaining to him, telling him that the Hong Kong people don't want Si Wai Long to continue to be the chief executive. And that he did not argue with them at all. Isn't that strange? And if you look again, even after the Occupy Central or the Umbrella Movement for so many days, Beijing has not condemned it as a counter-revolutionary movement. Only says it's illegal. Of course it's illegal. I committed a criminal offence. They was arrested twice. I, mean, I, I participated in an unauthorised assembly. We all know that. All right? And even though C. Y. Leung at the time kept on saying that the Americans were behind it, Beijing never said a word to that effect. So, and then what about day one of Occupy Central when the police threw tear gas at us? Not much bloodshed at all because they didn't follow up by hitting us on the head. Why? It is generally believed that Xi Jinping gave orders, no bloodshed. So when you think of these things, particularly the last visit to Hong Kong by this Chinese leader, I believe things are happening, although we haven't seen anything definite yet. I think things are, well, brewing, all right? And uh, I can't promise you anything. I have no crystal ball in front of me. But if you want to be hopeful, there is reason for your hope. That's all I can say. But if you want, if you go by the hard evidence, then I entirely agree with you. There will be no room for optimism, whether cautious or not. But I, it's not that straightforward, all right? It's not black and white completely. That's all I can say. And given the number of possible candidates who wouldn't resign the third time Beijing's liaison office told them what to do, why would anybody else who is very pro-Beijing be very much different? I think a lot of people in Hong Kong will say, yeah, if the next chief executive is also selected by Beijing, um, why would you feel it's much better? But I can tell you, my friends are already telling me, if anybody but see why gets it, they'll open their bottle of champagne. Because he, I don't think you can think of anybody 
who can be worse? <laughs> I mean, so in a way, it's very easy to be the next chief executive of Hong Kong, right? He's bound to enjoy a lot of popularity in the first month or so. But if thereafter, then he or she must continue to take orders from Beijing, then of course, this person's credibility will also come down, the popularity rating will also come down. I agree with you. But ABC, if you ask your Chinese friends, I think a lot of them would say, oh, of course. If he doesn't get a second term, a lot of people will open the champagne, like bottles of champagne, I tell you that. But if you think about it, why should you be happy if it is anybody, say, at the moment, uh, or the chief secretary, for example, right? And do you think that she would dare not to obey Beijing? But she would certainly come across better, all right? And uh, I mean, after all, Si Wan Long is this is a really funny guy. I mean, he tells lies all the time. And the lies are not even good lies. <laughs> I'm so, just wondering if that's a global political trend these days. <laughs> uh, just a quick question for me, going back to the theme of the next generation or, or young politicians. Um, people coming in, and obviously Josh Wong is sort of the poster example, they don't have the same perspective of pre-1997 or the drafting of the basic law or what Hong Kong was like. Do you think they're qualified? Do they have the stuff to take on leadership? And do you believe they are well organized? Well, they, of course, if Joshua Wong becomes a member of the legislature, not now, I'm afraid, it will be four years' time, I'm sure he would study our recent history. In fact, he knows these things. I can tell you he knows these things very well. I mean, it's, some of them have been asking me questions, and I can share with you. Shortly after the um, umbrella movement came to an end, a number of student leaders came to my chambers, and I discussed with them. I said, you guys want civic, a civic nomination, that is nomination of the chief executive by ordinary people, maybe 100,000, you know, that sort of number. Uh, yeah, we want that. So I said, why do you want that? Is it because you want nomination not to be exclusively, exclusively in the hands of Beijing? Yes. So you would like respectable people to be nominated. That's right. I say, okay, so you want civic nomination. Yes. And because the basic law doesn't allow for that, you want to amend the basic law. That's right. So I say, okay, I understand. Now, do you know how difficult it is to amend the basic law? Yes, we know. Because Article 159 says you can't even propose an amendment to the basic law. Originally, they said no way. Amendment of the basic law is by the central government or the National People's Congress. Hong Kong would have no, nothing to do with it whatsoever. So I fought for it. I was on the basic law committee. Now, the Hong Kong SAR can present a bill to amend the basic law, but you need two-thirds of the delegates to the National People's Congress from Hong Kong, two-thirds of them, right? plus two-thirds of LegCo members, plus the chief executive. Together, then they can propose the bill to amend the basic law. How many of these delegates do we have, National People's Congress, who will support us? No, I can tell you that. Maybe one, all right? So it's impossibility, they know that. So I said, what? but even if we get over that, even if we get over that, we could present a bill to amend the basic law, giving a civic nomination for the election of the chief executive, right? even if we get it, all right? And you amend the basic law. Do you trust Beijing? No. If you don't trust Beijing, whether you look at the basic law as it is today, or the basic law as it will be amended, hopefully, tomorrow, if you don't trust Beijing, how can it work? How can you expect it to give you what you want? 
So I said, why don't you look at the basic law again? Basic law requires the nomination of candidates in the election of the chief executive to be by a nomination committee, which are broadly representative, broadly representative. So I said to these student leaders, what can be more broadly representative than a nomination committee with every member elected democratically by the Hong Kong people. If you are looking at a nomination committee of 100 or 1,200, doesn't matter. If every one of them is elected by Hong Kong people democratically, would you have any objection to that? Of course, no. I said precisely. So it is possible to go for that. It is already written into the basic law, and there is no law yet in Hong Kong which says how membership um, would be constituted. So, so long as you insist on the members, every member of the nomination committee must be elected by Hong Kong people democratically within the basic law, you get what you want. So they say, ah, yeah. So I said, do you still want to amend the basic law? Why do you do something which is impossible rather than to do something which is there? <laughs> right? It's as simple as that. So um, they, they know, and they, they make sense. But if you say to them, but you can't even mention the word self-determination, then I say, why not? I mean, I, I'm on his side. Why not? It's freedom of speech. Right? Only saying it. And you don't have to worry about uh, there are other young people who are more extreme, of course. Some people actually talk about independence. So I said, well, under our constitutional setup, the only way to get independence is to start a revolution. That must be right. Because if you say to Beijing, please let us be independent, Beijing will say no. Then what do you do? They won't give you a referendum either. All right? So you must have a revolution. But these guys are not thinking of revolution. They want Hong Kong people to elect, him, to elect them into the present legislature. If you want to have a revolution, you ought to overturn the whole government, including the legislature. But why ask people to elect you into that legislature which you want to overturn? Does not make sense to me? All right? So don't worry about these people. If they want votes, then they are not serious about revolution. And after all, who ever talks about revolution? Revolution is something that you do quietly. All right? <laughs> In the U.S., uh, the mood is changing. Uh, you see, it's maybe there's a more isolationist move there. There's a distinct possibility that the very isolationist president will come to power in the U.S. Uh, soon. Uh, how will this affect uh, the discussion on democracy in uh, Hong Kong? And maybe I'd look at the question, same thing. Former Eastern European countries, which have become very enthusiastically uh, democratic societies, after the fall of the Soviet Empire, the mood there has become much more authoritarian again from the people down there. How is this going, this type of the, the, the wider context on discussion on democracy and foreign policy of big powers affecting the discussion on, this, on more democracy in Hong Kong for the next generation? So how would the growing isolationist spirit in politics, particularly in the United States, affect the mood in Hong Kong? Oh, you mean uh, Donald Trump? Oh. There was a hint of that, yeah. Well, <laughs> I've never thought, I've never tied Hong Kong's democratic movement to Donald Trump, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> because th this, this, this guy's interesting, because you never know what you're thinking about. Uh, I doubt even, I don't even know whether he thinks. Uh, and, and yet there's such a groundswell of support for him, which is very interesting. And, uh, and not just him, I mean, look, look at the newly elected president in the Philippines. He wants to shoot everybody, all the criminals, and he says, if you guys take the law into your own hands and shoot these uh, drug uh, kings or whatever, drug lords, then I give you a medal. I mean, so you have people like that all over the world. Um, and, uh, but I, I haven't tied it to Hong Kong. Now, U.S. policy on Hong Kong, that I can tell you something about that. And uh, there is this U.S. Hong Kong Policy Act, right, uh, which respects and ensures that one country, two systems will remain. 
Uh, and if the president of the USA thinks that Hong Kong has not got a high degree of autonomy anymore, and that one country, two systems is not being implemented, then the president may press the button, and then Hong Kong will be treated as any other Chinese city. And we won't have a separate quota of passports and whatever. Right? And, and uh, if uh, things cannot be uh, imported into China, then these things cannot go into Hong Kong and so on. But that particular measure is not very helpful to Hong Kong either. Now, but perhaps I answer your question in the other way, which is, I value the interest in Hong Kong shared by many foreign governments and many foreign uh, legislatures, because that is important. Hong Kong is an international city, so we need international support. And international support for Hong Kong was actually the result of the efforts of the Chinese government and the British government in 1984. Because both these governments did a lot of hard work urging the foreign governments to support the joint declaration when it was announced for the first time on the 26th of September 1984. And they did. And I was surprised at the time. Uh, Hong Kong was something between Britain and China under the Sino-British Joint Declaration. But why was there support uh, from so many other countries? Because they've been lobbying for support. So I want this overseas community, uh, the international community's interest in Hong Kong to continue. And I also say this, and I say to them in uh, Washington DC and other places and in Europe, that they owe Hong Kong people at least a moral obligation to speak up for us when something goes terribly wrong, like the disappearance of Li Bo and so on. Because if they support one country, two systems, they must speak up when one country, two systems is not working well. Now, I'll give you one more reason uh, to, be, to shed some of your pessimism, and that is, what is the official line now from the Chinese leader on the one country, two systems. He said that there mustn't be any distortion to the one country, two systems. No distortion. Now, it is possible to carry two meanings. The first is that President Xi says, don't worry, China will do what it says. The full implementation, full implementation of the one country, two systems policy no distortion as now, all right? But to me, it's hugely distorted. But if he were to say, if he were to mean no distortion to the, joint, to the one country, two systems as now, then I would expect this to continue until 2047. But if you construe it the other way, that he thinks that one country, two systems is being distorted and that there mustn't be distortions, then he would have to reverse the policy. All right? Then that would be a different story altogether. There would be room for cautious optimism. But I said the trouble with China is it's a black box. Nobody knows what's happening there. And so we just keep guessing. We've run out of time. Um, a huge topic for discussion. Martin Lee, thank you very much. A small gift from the FCC. We'll hope you come and join us again. And if you'd like to come and join us for Joshua Wong, you're most welcome. And to everyone, have a wonderful day. Thanks very much for coming.